Welcome back to the custom keyboard from scratch series. Last time we created our layout, defined our switch matrix, selected our microcontroller, and picked our optional features. If you haven't done some of these, that's okay, but you will have to do them eventually. For the demo board I'm creating, I'm using a standard 60% layout, the ATmega 32U4, and will include pins for an OLED display. In this video, we'll create the schematic and PCB, which starts with KiCad. KiCad is free and open source software for designing printed circuit boards and schematics. Install the newest version of KiCad, then create a new project. You'll be greeted by two files, a schematic and a PCB. Open up the schematic. Let's first introduce the most useful hotkeys. A allows you to add general components, such as resistors, diodes, switches, and microcontrollers. M allows you to move a symbol. R allows you to rotate that symbol and P allows you to place power symbols such as voltage rails and ground. Now that you know how to place components, go ahead and place your microcontroller. For me, that's the ATmega 32U4. I typically start with the microcontroller as it's the heart of the project. That said, you're free to work in whatever order you'd like. I should let you know that passives are defined by their characteristic letter, so a resistor is simply R, a capacitor C, a diode D, and an inductor L. More complex packages, such as microcontrollers, typically go by their full names. As you place components, you should refer to their data sheets to view typical implementation diagrams and schematics. Some are better than others, but they're all jam-packed with useful information. One thing of note is that websites occasionally link to cover sheets or series breakdowns in place of data sheets. These are typically much smaller than the actual data sheet and contain very little information. The proper data sheet for the 32U4 is 438 pages long. I'll now follow the data sheet to add the required components to boot this microcontroller. For the 32U4, that includes placing a 100 nanofarad capacitor at each power pin, placing a 1 microfarad capacitor on UCAP, and adding a 10K pull-up resistor and pull-down button to the reset pin. This is how we'll flash this board. I'll add 22 ohm series resistors to each USB data line, and finally I'll add the crystal. The crystal requires a capacitor at each side. Values for these are typically around 10 picofarad, but can be calculated from the crystal's data sheet. The 32U4 requires a 16 MHz crystal, but this will vary for different microcontrollers. With that supporting infrastructure complete, it's time to add USB. Type C, cause I'm no fool. I'd recommend the USB 2.0 receptacle for Type C, as it has all the necessary pins for C2C support and reversibility. You can leave the shield and SBU disconnected. Pressing Q atop a pin will place an X atop it, indicating that it's not connected. You should also add two 5.1 kilo ohm pull-down resistors on the CC lines. If you forget to include these, your board will only work with USB A to C cables and not C to C cables. Finally, I'll connect USB ground to ground and VBUS to plus 5 volts. I typically fail to include one, but you may wish to include a USB protection IC. It's basically a few Zener diodes, which dumps voltage spikes on the USB data lines to ground. This is what I have, but yours will likely differ. Let's now move on to the switch matrix, the other most important part. This will be large, so I'll create a new sheet with the S key, name it switch matrix, and double click it to enter the new sheet. I'll start by placing a single push switch and a diode, then extend the leads to create a cell. I'll copy the entire thing. Referencing the drawing we made in part 1, I'll paste, connecting them until I have the appropriate number of columns. Then, you can copy the entire thing again, and paste in the rows. Remove any extra cells from the matrix, again following your drawing as a reference. This is what I get for the demo board. I now need to label and annotate the matrix. I'll use global labels, placed with Control shift l to give each row and column a label, so it can be accessed from the main sheet. Now, annotate the sheet by clicking the Annotate button in the ribbon, selecting Sort Symbols by Y position, and clicking Annotate. This completes the work for the matrix. You can return back to the main sheet by pressing Alt Backspace. You can now add any optional features, such as LEDs, encoders, or displays. For LEDs, I might make a second sheet formatted something like this. For encoders and displays, I just throw them in the main sheet. When working with the SSD1306, I place a generic 4-pin connector and match the pins to my module. Almost done. If you're using an STM32 or similar, you'll need to add a voltage regulator to get the 5 volts from USB down to 3.3 volts. 
For simplicity, I'd recommend the AMS 1117 LDO, which should fit just fine here. You'll also want some additional filter capacitors to go with it. Throw a 10 microfarad at the input and output, and you should be set. Don't forget to use power symbols to mark each voltage. As a final consideration, you may wish to include an ISP header so that you have a second way to flash your microcontroller if something goes horribly wrong. This would be the SWD header for STM32 users. At this point, you should have a mostly complete schematic. You're free to copy the labels from your switch matrix and assign those to pins on the microcontroller. But I found that easier to do once I was happy with the switch and microcontroller placements on my PCB. This brings us to footprint assignment and component selection. Let's start easy with the key switches. If you're going fully custom, you probably already know which switches you intend to use. If not, you may wish to order a switch tester to find your favorites. I like cherry switches and think hot swap is king, so I'm going to assign cherry hot swap sockets for my switches. To do this, we first need a library of components. Luckily, one's available through the KiCad Content Manager. Navigate to the main KiCad window, then click Plugin and Content Manager. Tab over to Libraries and install the key switch library. Apply changes and close. You'll then need to include those libraries. Navigate to Preferences, Manage Footprint Libraries, and add these paths. Hit OK, then return to your schematic. To assign the newly added footprints, run the Footprint Assignment tool from the top ribbon. Automatically annotate the remainder of your schematic if necessary, then select all your key switches, and assign the appropriate footprint for the switches or hot swap sockets you intend to use. I start by assigning everything a 1U footprint, then manually update the switches that need different sizes. To manually update, you can right click a switch and select Edit Footprint or press F. You may wish to refer to the original JSON that you exported from your key map in part 1. The easiest package to assign a footprint to is the microcontroller. The datasheet should list the packages, or the supplier you intend to order from should list the package associated with the component you're about to order. In many cases, KiCad even has pre-assigned packages for microcontrollers. For USB-C, I like the HRO31M12 connector, as it's done everything I need it to do, and has proven easy enough to solder. The remainder should be capacitors, resistors, diodes, and a crystal. This will fall to you to pick components that match the correct value and are a suitable package. I basically exclusively use SMT, surface mount, packages at this point, and have sample books in 0402. 0402 components are like grains of sand, however, so you may wish to look into the 1206 SMT package or through-hole packages such as DIN 0207 if you intend to hand solder. Through-hole will present some challenges here, as the switches need to rest flush against the PCB, and your keyboard will likely be tight on space. One last thing of note is that you don't have to assign every footprint now. You can jump into the PCB design now, then go back as needed and use the current design to help choose a package that fits into the available space. So let's do just that. I'll skip assigning my passes of footprint for now and jump into the PCB. We do need one last thing from our schematic though, a net list. KiCad works in nets. A net is basically a common point or circuit node. Each pin gets assigned a net, such as plus 5 volts, ground, or one of your labels. That pin then needs to connect to all the other pins also assigned to that net. To get the netlist, go File, Export, Netlist, save it to a common area, then open the PCB and go File, Import, Netlist. Load and test, then update your PCB. You should now see a pile of keys and a few other components. I like to place these outside the sheet to start. Switching it up this time, I'll start with the switch matrix or layout as it makes the most sense here. But first, we need to change the grid settings. Select Grid, Edit User Grid, then set the user defined grid to 19.05 by 19.05 millimeters. This is, as far as I know, the standard spacing. You're free to set this to whatever you'd like, but I found this to be correct. You may wish to divide the X portion of this grid by some nice power of 2, such as 2, 4, 8, or 16, but I'll leave this as a whole one unit for now. Hit OK, then select the user grid. It's now time to place keys. You can move items with the M key as before, but I prefer a more direct approach. In KiCad, press T on your keyboard. This box calls the reference designator of a component to your cursor. 
As long as your matrix schematic looks similar to mine, you can type in SW1 and the first switch in the matrix should be brought to your cursor. This should be escape, grave, or whatever the top left key is. Place it somewhere near the top of the page, then repeat it to call in switch 2, 3, and so on until you hit the end of the row. You can then call in the next key and start the next row. Repeat this until your matrix is complete, and you can finally divide the grid if you haven't already to finish the arrangement. I've ended up with this. I'll now jump down to the standard 0.254mm grid and move my microcontroller around to see where it best fits. I'll also flip it to put it on the same side of the PCB as my hot swap sockets. You'll definitely need to keep track of orientation here. By default, red is the front copper and blue is the back copper. Make sure you don't accidentally mirror your board. You can press Alt 3 to view a 3D render of the board. Finally, if your switch matrix hangs off the sheet, you can go File, Page Setup, and change the size of the page to better fit. Before you go much further, you should take note of trace directions. Since traces can't intersect, you need to cross above or below. As such, I'd recommend using one side of your board for horizontal traces and using the opposite side for vertical traces. You can use vias to switch layers. This way you don't lock yourself into a corner, requiring you redo large sections of the trace layout. I guess I finally have to talk about component selection. This one's hard for me. I don't know what to tell you other than to pick components that match your specs and that you can solder. Finding components can be hard though, so where to look? I like LCSC as the prices are low and the shipping times are slower. Mauser or DigiKey work too, but expect to pay 10 times more for the passives. Larger stuff like microcontrollers are generally priced about the same. Use as many filters as possible to find what you need. I like to filter by value, then by package, then by price. May as well tack on an in-stock as well to hide the out-of-stock and discontinued stuff. Value is easy, it's in the schematic, but what about package? That's a personal thing. It takes time and experience to know what packages you like to work with. I like the microscopic 0402 package as it saves a lot of space, especially around microcontrollers. I'd advise a beginner to stay well clear of them though. I think this project has space for 1206, so that'll be my blanket recommendation if you're entirely unsure. Shrink that down as you see fit. One recommendation for beginners who haven't searched for components before is to start with the resistors and capacitors. Search for and filter the resistors and capacitors, then add those to your cart first. This gives you some practice with the filters and hopefully prepares you to order your microcontroller and any other components you may need. Given the choice between general purpose diodes and Shockey diodes, you should pick Shockey for your matrix, as they're slightly quicker to react, but are worse at blocking current. I'll use the SOD323 package in this board, and I'll pick a reasonable enough but mostly random diode from my component supplier. I'll add in these diodes, then draw my rows and columns. That leaves me with a structure like this. Now is probably not a bad time to route VBUS from the USB input. Make sure each VCC pin receives power, and that you're not blocking yourself in. This can be tricky, so don't be afraid to take multiple attempts. While we're routing from the USB, let's also talk about the USB data lines. USB can tolerate some abuse, but you should learn to impedance match these traces. USB has a characteristic impedance of 90 ohms. To give our traces that characteristic impedance, we must calculate their width. Open up the calculator tools. In the Transline tab, I typically use coplanar waveguide with ground plane. It works, but isn't ideal. Coupled microstrip line would be the correct option, but it doesn't seem to function at the time of writing. Basically, you can leave the defaults aside from height, which you should set to the thickness between your trace and ground pore. This is probably 1.6 millimeters. Then set Z0 to 90 ohms, set the clearance of your ground pore as S, and click Synthesize. This is how thick your USB data lines should be. If it's really thin, make sure it's wide enough that your boardhouse can fab it. You can find that info on the boardhouse's capabilities page. You can round it up or down, just try to keep it roughly around that size. I'll use 0.15 millimeters, as I know JLC's minimum width is 0.127 millimeters for two layer boards. You should also route the data traces as differential pairs. This can be done by clicking and holding on the trace button, then dragging over to the differential pairs button. Make sure the data plus and data minus nets have a plus and minus at the end, which signifies a diff pair to KiCad. 
Then just draw the traces across the board, taking care to avoid getting too close to any other traces. The last two things I need to talk about are edge cuts and grounding. On the edge.cuts layer, draw the outline for your PCB. I went about 2mm away from the edge of the switches, then placed my edge.cuts. I also rounded the corners. Once you have your edge.cuts in place, you should select the zone fill tool, select all of your copper layers, and fill using ground. Set it up with your clearances, and hit OK. Box the entire board. Complete the rectangle, and double click the zone. You should now have a big colored zone which represents ground. Make sure it connects to every component that needs ground, and check for any gaps. You'll want to use vias to stitch the top and bottom of this pour together. Use vias to bring the ground pour into any large areas where it may only be on the top or bottom. With that, I'll leave you to route the rest of your board and to place your components in a manner that appears easy to assemble. Take care to review your board a few times and make sure that everything is truly connected. The rat's nest should show you, but it can be easy to miss. Definitely run DRC, which will inform you of any issues with your board. Some can be safely ignored, and others will be critical. You should also spend some time cleaning up your silk layers, too. Arrange any reference designators you plan to silk on, and add any easter eggs you want on the final board. You may also wish to add a version number somewhere, so you know what hardware revision you're on. For a really clean look, consider removing the reference designators, and adding a JLC 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 under the microcontroller on the silk layer if you're using JLC PCB. This hides the order number once the board's fully assembled. Once you've given it a final review and are happy, it's time to export Gerbers. Go to File, Plot, and Create a Gerbers folder. Then click Plot. You'll also want to create drill files in the same location. I use the defaults for all of these without issue. You can use the Gerber viewer and import the Gerbers to see what the board house is going to get. Make sure it all looks right. Once you're completely happy, navigate to where you saved those files and zip them up. Then drag and drop it to your board house, configure the board's properties, and order it. While you've got your card out, don't forget to order your components too. This concludes part two. Hopefully it was helpful. As before, leave some comments below letting me know what I missed and what I should do in the future.